today by popular demand, we're going to be taking a look at the Japanese eras as they pertain to traditional Japanese tattooing. We'll be focusing on the Daisho and the Showa eras, the characteristics of tattooing at the time, as well as the evolution of tattooing techniques throughout the periods. We're also going to be taking a look at several exemplary tattoos from legendary Horishi such as Horiuda the first and Horiyoshi the second. But before we do that, let's actually take a step back and look at the Japanese time periods for reference. As it pertains to traditional Japanese tattoos, we have the Edo period from 1603 all the way to 1868. And this is the time where a lot of the ukiyo-e woodblock prints that would come to serve as reference for traditional Japanese tattoos would come to be. Then we have the Meiji period from 1868 to 1912. And this was the period where Japan was becoming a modern nation. This meant that tattooing was actually frowned upon as it would seem barbaric in the eyes of a civilized nation. After the Meiji period, we have the Taisho era, spanning from 1912 to 1926. After that, we have the Showa period from 1926 to 1989. This is a period of radical change. We have the World War II, and then we have, of course, the post-war environment and all the changes that all these dramatic events came to bring. Tattooing, of course, also saw a dramatic change in the techniques employed, in the materials used, and so on and so forth, as we will be taking a look at in a few minutes. After the Showa period, we have the Heisei era from 1989 all the way to 2019. And finally, we have the Reiwa period from 2019 all the way to the present. And so right now we're in the Reiwa era as per the Japanese time periods. The Taisho era spanning from 1912 to 1926 is considered by some to be one of the more pure time periods in traditional Japanese tattooing. And this is due to the lack of foreign influence. One of the characteristics of the time is the use of a very limited color palette, limited to base colors such as sumi and shu, with shu being a, sort of a crossover or a mix between red and orange. There were forced pigments available, meaning other colors were available, but they were extremely dangerous and so they weren't really used. In fact, red itself, shu, was so dangerous due to the amount of heavy metals in it that many people would get sick. They would get fevers and chills after the tattooing sessions. And so wearing the color red was seen as a sign of strength, not only because the wearer went through the pains of tattooing, but they also went through the pains of the fevers and the chills that accompany the use of, of shoe. One of the anecdotes from legendary Horishi of the later Showa period involves boiling the shoe ink so that the mercury would float to the top and then he would scoop it out and use that ink on the person, right? But just imagine in the Taisho period, it's probable that most Horishi might not even do that. And so he had a very heavy concentration of heavy metals, which translated into people really getting very sick after their tattooing sessions. Another characteristic of the period is the use of very thick, strong, sumi backgrounds. They almost seemed like a 90-10 sort of division of the Sumi employed versus the skin breaks. And so when you look at it from afar, it really looks like this just huge canvas of black with very, very thin white or really skin color accents. And so with the Taisha period, the backgrounds had relatively thin bars, whether it's wind bars or waves. Right. And so again, very strong, powerful, thick, black backgrounds. The application of tattoos during the Taisho era really was all by hand using the hand poke or hand carved method, tebori. And this use of an old tebori method is actually referred to as sotebori. So the Taisho era was really the sotebori era where everything was done by hand. The outlines were done by hand, the shading was done by hand, everything was done by hand. Whether impacted by the Sotebori or Oltebori method or not is up for debate, but another characteristic of the Taisho era was the relatively simpler character designs, right? You have bigger, older, simpler elements. That's not to say that there weren't details 
within the tattoos because they there were, as we're about to see in a couple of minutes, but they were relatively simpler, bolder tattoos. On a similar note, even though there were simpler character designs, there was actually a wider adoption of Mikiri variations. You had the Botan Mikiri, the Peony Mikiri, you have the Akebono Mikiri, the Dawn Slide Mikiri, you had the Matsuba Mikiri, the Pine Needle Mikiri. You had a lot of many different Mikiris at play. Of course, I'm not naming them all, but relative to later times, so such as the Showa and then, of course, subsequent time periods, there was a wider use of different Mikiri variations. If you had to describe the Daisho era tattooing in very simple terms, perhaps some of the terms that would come to mind would be simple, bold, and powerful. We had very bold and powerful backgrounds. You had very simple and strong character design, and everything was done by hand. Moving on to the Showa era from 1926 to 1989, this was a relatively long time period of dramatic, dramatic change. During this time, the world was at war, and then it was not at war, and so you had the post-war period. Japan opened up to the world, and there was influence from the outside, from the West, particularly strong influence from the Americas. And so all these influences would come to, of course, impact the world of traditional Japanese tattooing. By introduction of the American GIs and the Americans, you had the introduction of more colors. You had the introduction of more industry standard ink, which was relatively safer. And of course, it also offered that wider variety of colors that Japanese horishi could actually employ in their work. The Americans also introduced the use of the tattooing machine, which would come to really change and impact the way that tattoos were done in Japan. Some horishi stuck to their guns and they stayed devori only. Others welcomed the machine and, and its efficiencies with open arms and adopted a machine-only approach, and others took a hybrid approach where they would use the machine for its efficiency, for its precision, for outlining, and then they would do the shading by devori. This introduction of colors, of the machine, of foreign influence, undoubtedly had a very big impact in the world of traditional Japanese tattooing and Japanese horishi, and we would see dramatic changes in the ways that tattoos were done. We would see more dynamic styles come into fruition. The backgrounds were more dynamic. You would see movement in the wind, in the waves, in the clouds. You would see more movement in the character design. The backgrounds themselves would change and there would be larger skin breaks, more gradation into the, let's say, the wind bars, for example, where before it might be a 90-10, of black to, let's say, gray or just skin color. And now it might be more of a 60-40 to take a random example, right? You would have this gradation of color in the backgrounds, black, gray, skin. This might seem hard to visualize, but of course, in a few minutes, we'll be taking a look at some pictures representative of the style of the times, and it'll make a lot more sense when you see what I mean by the skin bricks. You, of course, also had an evolution in character design with a lot more details coming into play. A lot more details in, let's say, the clothing, the armor, and so on and so forth of the characters, in the backgrounds, in the characters themselves, right? There was an evolution in the level of detail that was possible, of course, by machine, but even those doing Temori only also saw a huge change in the level of detail that was being deployed in the tattoo compositions. Lastly, pertaining to the Mikiri, we also saw a rather narrowing of the adoption of the different Mikiri types, where the more prevalent Mikiri types were the Botan Mikiri, the Peony Mikiri, and the Bukiri, which was the straight cut off Mikiri, right? Which was somewhat of a, a feat of precision. And so it came to be quite popular from the Showa era onwards. Of course, I'm focusing on very marked characteristics at a very high level of the times, but of course, just because the Taisho period ended doesn't mean that people are still not doing Taisho style uh, tattoos even today, right? In fact, our good friend London Slade, who we had the first The Figure Behind the Ink interview with, actually focuses on Taisho era style tattoos and you can see a very powerful employment of that limited color palette 
and of those Daisho era style backgrounds. So I encourage you to check that interview out and check out his compositions. Now, I've been talking a lot about the characteristics of the different styles in the Daisho and the Showa eras, but let's actually take a look at some of the exemplary compositions of the times by masters such as Horiyuno the first and Horiyoshi the second. So what we have here is a tattoo by the legendary Horishi, Horiyuno the first. But before we get to analyzing this tattoo, let's actually take a step back and talk about the person himself. Horiyuno the first is one of the legendary Horishi that would come to establish a quite powerful family in the world of Japanese tattooing, and his tattoos would come to have an amazing impact, not just on tattooers of the time, but many of the tattooers to come. In fact, Horiyuno the first and his family established what was then the Kanda Choyukai, a tattoo club, if you will, which would then expand and evolve to become the Edo Choyukai, Edo being the name for the old name for Tokyo. And this is actually a tattoo club that is very much well alive today. So this tattoo composition is actually titled Namikiri Chojun. And we can see Chojun here, one of the Suikoden outlaws, cutting through the waves. And thus the name Namikiri. Namikiri meaning cutting through the waves. We can see a water background waves at the bottom of this bodysuit. We see Chojun with his sword cutting through the waves. He's tattooed with the dragon, and then of course you have other elements in the picture to accentuate the scene. Now, of course, what you're seeing here that is very apparent to the eye is the limited color palette. You really have two base ingredients, that being Sumi and the shoe. Sumi being that suit from different substances depending on the ingredients, and again, that shoe being that crossover between red and orange, what some would call vermilion. And if you recall from previous interviews, such as the interview with London Slade, Sumi actually has many different hues depending on the source materials of the ink. Some Sumi can have bluish hues, other Sumi ink can have greenish hues, brownish hues, so on and so forth. And so, depending on the Sumi ink that you use and how you, let's say, water it down, you can have a lot of many different colors at play, such as we see here. We see a combination of blacks, grays, reds, oranges, and so on and so forth. We can also see here the relatively, let's call it 90-10 combination of the, of the background, right? The skin breaks. It really very much looks like a almost all black background, right? And those very, very fine skin accents or skin breaks provide that contrast. So it's a very high contrast tattoo and very much representative of the Daisho era. Moving along here, we have another piece by Horiyuno the first. This piece is titled Hinazumi Koboshi Gaiden. And what we see here is a monk facing off against a feral cat. And again, very, very traditional Taisho era style tattoo, very limited color palette, very, very powerful background. You can see the red lightning. You can see the red momiji. You can see the different shades of gray and how they make the cat obviously stand out from the old black background. And the character himself, the monk himself, has different shades of black. Now, important to note is the age of the wearer. You can see that he's a gentleman of advanced age. And even then, this tattoo actually looks pretty darn fantastic. It has stood the test of time, the test of, let's say, sun exposure, right? And even though it's been exposed to a lot of sun, even though it's been exposed to the degradation that comes with time, it still very much looks like a very powerful, well-preserved tattoo. This next piece that we're looking at right now is actually by Horiuno II. And who we have here is Takiya Shahime. And you can see her holding a parasol and a squall. In the background, you can see clouds and chrysanthemum or kiku. And in her robes, you can actually see a lot of details, even though this was a Taisho era style tattoo done sotebori all by hand. You can still see that even then, 
the patterns and the clothing design was actually rather advanced. You can see Momiji in this clothing pattern and you can see many different deep levels of detail in here. Of course, the first thing that stands out is the limited color palette, but even with the limited color palette, you see reds, you see browns, you see oranges, you see blacks, and so on and so forth. Again, very limited use of the skin breaks to accentuate the body and the contrast. And so a very representative piece of the times. The last piece we're looking here from a Taisho era style perspective is a Munewari suit. And this is a Kiku Chirashi or scattered chrysanthemums. And of course, I sound like a broken record by now, but what you can see really is limited color palette, reds, grays, black, fantastic. It looks fantastic. It looks, again, very high contrast, very powerful. And this just goes to show simple doesn't mean bad. In fact, simple can mean quite fantastic. Lastly, I'll note the Mikiri variation employed here. Of course, Bota Mikiri, the Peony Mikiri, which is, of course, again, very representative of the times. So now let's take a dive into the Showa era style of tattoos. Here we have a work by Horiyoshi II. This composition is titled Sumizore. Sumizore being the spirit of a cherry blossom tree. And some of the first things that come to mind when you look at this piece is just one, just how colorful it is. And also two, the level of details. You can see a lot of colors being employed here. You, you see reds, you see greens, you see yellows, blacks, many colors. You also see a lot of detail in the robes of the spirit here, of the cherry blossom spirit. An incredible amount of detail in the clothing. Now you might look at this and say, of course, that's just the use of machine at play. But actually no, because this was actually done by Devori and it just goes to show the evolution of styles, right? So looking at this composition right here, not only is it a beautiful, incredible composition, but really the colors and the level of details alone go on to show that really this is a different style. This is a different era. If we move along to the front of this gentleman, he also has a Munewari bodysuit. And what we're seeing here is uh, Kumadori Chirashi or the Kabuki makeup uh, scattered throughout the bodysuit here. And we see again, a lot of color, but more importantly, we also see a lot of dynamism in the background. Now, this dynamism was really something that Oriyoshi II, Mr. Kuronuma came to excel at. And he really was one of the pioneers of this very dynamic background style. This is an excellent composition just to represent the, the Showa style, because again, a lot of colors being employed, a lot of details, and a lot of dynamism in the backgrounds. You can also look at the backgrounds themselves and notice how the skin breaks are, la are larger. Also notice the gradation in the colors, in the backgrounds, right? It's not all black. You see a lot more gray. You see a lot more skin. And so this style of background would really come to be prominent in the Showa era and beyond. Moving on to a third example by Horiyoshi II. This is a fantastic back piece of Orochimaru. And again, we see extremely dynamic background at play, extremely detailed piece. If you look at the details in the clothing of Orochimaru here, a lot of details in the robes, a lot of details in the clothing, in the jewelry, and so on and so forth. You can see in the bottom rocks, waves, at the top, you see clouds swirling, a lot of wind moving around. And of course, the Orochi, the giant serpent in there with really different degrees of black and gray, showing that this is very much a Showa era tattoo. The front of this gentleman is no less impressive. You see, again, extreme movement in the background here. This background is insane. The amount of movement in here in the clouds, in the wind. We have Jiraiya and Tsunade Hime. You have the, the toad, the giant toad, and the giant slug or giant snail. And of course, you have Orochi or giant serpents throughout. Red lightning, Momiji, red, green, gray, blue, 
many colors, many details. Chiraya and Tsunade Hime themselves have a lot of details in their clothing, in their weaponry, and so on and so forth. And so again, this is a, an extremely good example of how the Showa era style came to be very powerful, very dynamic, and very different from the previous Daisho era. So just to recap, we noticed a lot of different, a lot of marked differences in the Daisho and Showa era style tattoos. The Daisho era, very limited color palette, very strong, bold, mostly black backgrounds, and relatively simpler character design. The Showa era, extremely dynamic backgrounds and character designs, extremely detailed work, a lot more color because, of course, industry standard inks came into play, came into the world of traditional Japanese tattooing, and then also markedly different in the backgrounds, a lot more skin breaks, a lot more gradation in the backgrounds, a lot of more of the skin being shown, a lot more black with gray gradations at play. Both eras, incredible tattooing styles, both eras styles very much well alive today, and also incredibly legendary Borishi from each era that would come to impact the world of Japanese tattooing and beyond. Now, this was a very high level comparison or view into the world of traditional Japanese tattooing in the Taisho and the Showa eras. But if you'd like to see more in-depth discussion, if you'd like to see other eras being covered or just any other topics, just let me know and I'll make sure to create some content for everyone to watch, so everyone to hear and enjoy. Thank you very much for watching. Like the video, subscribe, and stay tuned for more great content in the world of Obori. If you would like to learn more about the world of traditional Japanese tattooing, follow the Waburipedia Instagram page, hit like and subscribe in the YouTube and Spotify channels, and stay tuned for the meanings and stories behind Japanese tattooing, horishi interviews, and more.